Okay, thank you, Samir, and thank you, Anand, as well. And uh, very nice to be here at Garje Marathi. I have been so you can see my screen. Yes, you can see the yes, screen. Yes, we can. Perfect. Very, we can. Very good. Yeah. So um, I have been. So this is the topic for today, and it's very nice to see so many people here because this is a quite a complex subject because we are combining two very leading edge things, which is AI and IoT, which is edge. Uh, but it is a subject I teach at Oxford, so I'm very familiar with this more. Than than most people in that sense. Now, the key thing is, as uh, was mentioned in my introduction, I am uh, I have a mixture of academia, industry, and also entrepreneurship, meaning that I'm on the board of uh, two companies, one in Germany and one in New York. I am also uh, teaching at Oxford and also LSE and, um, and Harvard Kennedy Society. And of course, I have my own consulting practice. So in that sense, it's a very wide experience which I can I can share and hopefully you can learn from this. And again, I am very familiar with how startups work and things like this, so it's 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 quite useful. The other thing is that in Gajay Marathi, I am quite known for this AI mentoring program, which uh, at the initiation in, at the request of Anand, I started off uh, a few months ago over the summer and we were very successful in this. We have five uh, entrepreneurs from the Marathi community who I mentored and they've gone on to build their own products and this is very good. And of course, we are going to start under the AI innovation, under the Innovation Academy, Garji Marathi Innovation Academy, we are going to start another program in January. If you are interested in this to be a part of this, uh, please contact Anand and then he will explain the process, but we will announce this very soon as well. So this is of course a voluntary effort for the community. It is a completely uh, a, a social thing and if you have your own company, then you keep the intellectual property. We help you to build something and hopefully we, we, it's great for you. Now, uh, this is what I teach in Oxford, and as it says, uh, it covers both the cloud and the edge uh, for AI. It is a full stack AI course, which makes it very unique uh, and also very complex. It stretches for months, about four or five months, and also we are working with Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Intel, ARM, NVIDIA, just about everybody under the sun. So I'm very well connected in the AI space. And also this fact that we are bringing, creating something which is so complex and that it's no one person can do this. I'm always humble about this, that AI is not a subject which one person can understand and especially like this. So before I start, this is a very important sort of a point I want to mention that when people talk about AI, they get the sort of ideas about uh, Terminator and uh, sort of things and so on and so forth. But from my point of view, it is very straightforward. These are the definitions I'm going to use in general, uh, not necessarily today, but overall. And the firstly, the idea of machine learning is you explicitly train an algorithm. You use data to train the algorithm. Deep learning, meaning that you use the data you train the algorithm and also understand the features of the data set, meaning you don't tell it how the structure of the data. And this works with deep learning. The word artificial intelligence, I talk about as machines that can learn and reason on their own. Mostly these are based on deep learning algorithms. Then the word narrow artificial intelligence is what we are seeing today, which is that most of the times AI is in the context of a specific domain. So for example, healthcare, for example, cybersecurity, for example, financial services. So it is a specific problem which we are addressing with AI. And then finally, there is a term called general AI, which means AI for just about everything. And this of course is not uh, seen today. This is what the Terminator movie would look like where you have a humanoid artificial intelligence entity which will come into a world and will act as if it is human characteristic. And of course, this is science fiction today, but of course the media gets confused with that and mostly people talk about that kind of scenario much more, but in practical terms, making best use of it, this is, we, we, are, we are talking about almost everything but that, yes. Now, coming to the basic idea of how an AI looks like. Uh, so this is how most of the machine learning problems look like, meaning that you take a training data, you uh, find out, you, you train the model and you deploy the model to make a prediction. You take some input data which you have not seen before and on the basis of that you make a prediction. So this is the classic kind of the, the flow of machine learning problems, yes. Now when we take this to deep learning and when we take this to uh, uh, IoT, what you see 
is that you see two flows. The first one is the training of the model, which is happening based on taking pictures, for example, of cats and dogs and things like this, and you're trying to train the model. And the second one is the deploying the inference where it sees the picture of something and and finds says that this is the dog. Yes, so you train the model to detect based on dogs, cats, a raccoon and so on and so forth. And what you're seeing is that you show it the picture of a dog and it says that this is a dog. Yes, now the typical difference here is that in IoT and in machine learning uh, for AI for edge devices, and I will come back to say what is the meaning of the word edge devices. Uh, this second part is happening on on a phone or on a Internet of Things device or something like this. Yes, so what you're doing typically, typically not all the time, typically you're training the model in the cloud and you're deploying the model on an edge device. It could be as small as a Raspberry Pi or it could be a phone or something like this. Yes. Now, why does this matter? This matters because if you think about the vision of Internet of Things, Internet of Things has been around for a long time and the original vision was from a guy called Mark Weiser or Weiser. He was from the Palo Alto Park community from Xerox and he had this idea of things which are connected to each other. Yes, so for example, you have sort of some device or some sensor which is capable of both finding other sensors, understanding what they are, having the same protocol, communicating with them, sharing data, keeping privacy and so on and so forth. Now this problem, while it sounds very exciting, it is actually very hard to do. Yes, because it's very hard to have a single standard which combines all these devices together, makes all these devices talk to each other, have them share data, keep the security, keep the privacy and so on and so forth. So while this vision was very interesting, it quite didn't take off, partly because it's very hard to implement this in real practice. Yes, so the idea of Internet of Things is quite old and it's been around for a long time. Yeah, so in the typical Internet of Things world, this is how the world would look like. The network would be connected to everything and everything would be talking to everything else, whether it is humans, cycles, houses, cars, uh, phones, everything, plants even, and animals even. Yes, so this is the vision of Internet of Things. The problem, of course, with this vision is that it is very hard to actually implement this because it's very hard for these things to find and communicate with each other. Yes, uh, by the way, I will take questions. We will have a lot of time for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, also please post them on the chat and I will take them with that. Uh, I can also share my slides uh, with Anand as well afterwards, so that will be also quite quite welcome with that. Yeah, so coming back to the problem of what is Internet of Things? Yes, so Internet of Things, you can think about an Internet of Things as a smart object and a smart object has five characteristics. The first one is it has identity, meaning that it is a typical IP address, typically IPv6 nowadays. Yes, obviously. Then it has a communication mechanism. Yes, there is no point having a device which cannot communicate. So it has some form of a radio in it, whether it is Bluetooth, it is Wi-Fi or it is 5G or it is 4G or even 2G. Yes, but it has some way of communicating with other devices. Otherwise, it is no point. The third thing it must have is it must have a set of sensors or actuators. Yes, there is no point having something which doesn't understand what is around it. A sensor is recording something, so it's like a temperature sensor, a pressure sensor or something like this. An actuator is something which does something. So for example, an actuator is something we can open a door. Yes, so those that that is what a sensor or an actuator would do. And finally, then you must have a physical and a social context, meaning that you have something which knows what is around it, in the physical context and also in the social context. So it must know who your friends are nearby, all that type of thing. And finally, it must have capability to run on edge devices. And I'll come back to what an edge is at the moment, and it must take these decisions on the edge. So if I'm sitting, thinking of it, uh, of sitting in a cafe, then I have a device which is capable not only of knowing that I am in this Starbucks at this time, uh, and this is the temperature around me, this, these are the people around me, and so on and so forth. Yes, and then it can run offline on the edge device as well. So this is generally where the classic definition of Internet of Things is operating. Yes, because you need to take away all these 
things around it and come back to very clear taxonomy yes clearly understanding that this is what a smart object means these are the five things a smart object contains yes now we come to the world of the internet of things and this is how it looks like yes typically in the world of Internet of Things, everything is connected to the Internet and this is great. Yes, uh, as I mentioned to you, it's not an easy world to kind of work with within there. Then you come to the idea of edge computing. So the difference between the, this diagram and the previous diagram is that you have something here in the middle, which is an edge device and the other devices are connected to that edge device. Yes, and there is a, a machine learning component here on this device. Yes, and that is what we are trying to say here that this device is called an edge device to which the Internet of Things sensors are connected. What is the meaning of edge computing? Edge computing is a dis distributed computing mechanism, meaning that it is not centralized. Typically it has um, all these sensors which are connected and they connect to each other within that. It brings computation and data storage to the device. Yes, this means that it is possible to do computation and data storage on the device. Why would you want to do this? It's partly because that bandwidth is expensive and latency is important. Yes, so bandwidth meaning that you need you don't want to send all the data back to the cloud because Internet of Things connects can collect collects massive amount of data. Yes, so what you actually want to do is actually process this data on the device itself. That's why the device must have computation. It must have storage and all these things as well. And the second thing is that it must be able to manage latency. Latency meaning that the, 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 the difference between your input and your response. Uh, and why do you need fast latency? Because many problems do not cannot wait for that long for the network trip to be sent back to the sensor and back again and so on. So what you need is a very fast response. So rather than waiting and sending everything back to the cloud, you do this on the device itself, which means also ironically enough, it also needs to connect offline or work offline. Uh, that means that the device can run offline. It can run, does not need to be connected to the server. Uh, it can it can run on uh, offline as well. And that device can be anything. It, it can be a CPU, it can be a GPU, it can be an ASIC FPGA from uh, Intel and all that kind of stuff. So the key difference between the pure Internet of Things me mechanism and, uh, and the edge computing mechanism is that first of all, edge computing recognizes that there is the need to have a device which has some uh, capability which would include the capability to uh, run something online sorry offline it would also have storage it would have processing power it would handle the data on its own it will not send all the data back to the cloud it will process and send some of the data back to the cloud as needed uh, and that is the sort of the fundamental difference and ironically enough of course the edge device needs the cloud and this is the whole point about what I'm trying to tell you that why Internet of Things or edge devices edge computing has taken off now is because it can work within the framework of the cloud and that is the big difference between the historic vision where everything connects to everything else. Typically in a cloud you have some framework, you have some security mechanism, you have some control over devices. In fact in the last Garje Marathi innovation Academy. We had a young 19 year old a student called Shreyas Panditra who created a very interesting device using um, using such a mechanism, meaning that it was uh, it was exactly this model where he was running something on a small uh, hardware device uh, which was connected to the cloud uh, and doing edge computing in that sense. So this is the sort of an interesting idea where people are now saying that rather than worrying about everything connecting to everything else, let us worry about things which are capable to connect to the cloud. You can manage the some things from the cloud, something from the edge, and of course that becomes a very powerful idea. Now, what is all this got to do with AI? Yes, so the thing with AI is that what you are doing in this situation is that you are able to train the AI model in the cloud and push it on the edge device. And I come back to this slide here where I showed you this idea and I told you that AI had the training phase. So if you look at this slide here, so this is what you are doing in the training phase um, and but it is also the deployment phase. So typically the deployment phase is happening on the edge device. So the edge device can run any sort of software. And of course, one of the things it runs is the AI model. Yes, and this is where a lot of the connections between AI and edge are coming together.
Yeah, and what does that mean is that you have certain type of devices which are very interesting, for example, Raspberry Pi, uh, and you have certain type of applications which are absolutely driving AI at the moment. Everything from drones, everything from self-driving cars, all of these things are being driven as edge devices, and, and this is where the, the typical sort of advantage of AI and edge computing is happening, where both of these things are going together, where you are training the model in the cloud, pushing it on an edge device, uh, doing the computation in this way, and that is creating things like drones, things like uh, self-driving cars, and so on. And the devices can be anything. So it can be like, for example, this is the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and this is a device called the NVIDIA Jetson. And all of those devices are, are capable of running an AI model on their own. Yes, so what I'm trying to say here is that in this case of a Jetson, NVIDIA Jetson, you're training the model on the cloud, pushing the trained model on the device. So model is like an executable. Yes, so in if you think about uh, any other computing paradigm, you have an exe file. So model is like creating an executable for something uh, and then using that executable on the device. Yes, so this is what is happening here. And you have all these devices which are possible uh, with that. And this idea is very powerful because a whole bunch of things, specifically video related things are working on edge devices. Why video? Obviously because video has a lot of data and all that data you don't need to send across to the cloud. So all that data is typically processed on the edge device. In fact, you wouldn't be able to run a self-driving car without that because self-driving cars absolutely need this capability. So this idea is actually with us now. Yes, so this idea of AI and edge is already with us now. And the reason why it is here is because AI and edge go very well together and AI and edge go well together because you can train the model in the cloud and push it on the edge device. And this is what is driving the whole situation. Now, of course, that there are this is actually happening into so many places and the most common one which people don't realize is Alexa. Yes, so anything which has got like a speaker, like a Google voice and anything like that, where it is possible to talk into a speaker and it is possible it can speaker can tell you what it is. So you can you have a response. It can tell you what it is. Why is this an edge device is because for every time it can't go back to the cloud. So what it does is it trains the model in the cloud and and runs it on that speaker. Yes, so and the speaker is is absolutely uh, running as an artificial intelligence device and therefore this same idea works with self driving cars. The same idea works with um, security cameras. The same idea works with manufacturing. Yes, so all these cases, especially things like manufacturing where you do not have a very good network. So typically you do not need, you cannot rely on the existence of the network. So you say that you are always training the model in the cloud and pushing it in an edge device and it's running here. The obvious question is that if you do this and your device is not connected, how will it keep updated? So obviously when you update it, you will have to refresh it again. Yes, so this capability of running offline is not forever, but it's possible in the majority of the cases. So typically when it runs offline, it can run on its own, but it's up at some point needs to connect back to the cloud and share its data and receive the new version of the AI model. And this model is very powerful because this idea is becoming very common with a lot of things. Now I can take this even further. It depends on how technical you are, but in a large company, for example, you would put this in a container, in a Docker container. Yes. So if you have heard this word DevOps, so yes. So what then happens is there is a word called MLOps. Yes, which is machine learning and DevOps together. Yes. Why does that happen? Is that this whole problem which I have explained to you can work within the dev DevOps architecture, meaning that you are training the model in the cloud, you are creating the model, you are pushing it as the Docker container, you are pushing the container either to the cloud or the edge or a smaller device, and then you are specifically deploying this. This is actually from Microsoft Azure, and uh, but the model is exactly the same. Google is doing this, NVIDIA is doing this, uh, Tesla is doing this, everybody else is doing the exact same idea that you are able to train something in the cloud, uh, put it in a Docker container, 
push it on an edge device. So if you don't know what Docker is and things like this, don't worry about it. But I think that if you Google the word MLOps, you should be able to find that quite easily. And many of those ideas are working quite strongly into this into the structure, meaning that they are able to pick up models which are trained in the cloud, run on edge devices, run in containers and so on and so forth. So coming back to my slide here before, what would happen here is that this thing would be in a container. Yes, so this would be when it actually runs the device, this device would be in a Docker container and then it would work in that way. So this is now combining AI with IoT plus typical uh, sort of enterprise architecture within there. And this is classically what we teach at Oxford because this idea is, is really very strong. It works everything from a bank to a, a small device. Uh, and of course, the areas we work with are like cybersecurity and so on and so forth, where all these ideas are, are, are very critical within there. So in real terms, this is again how it looks like. So you train something on the cloud, you format it and then you push it to all these different devices. Yes, so this is why I mean that the word of edge computing and the word of cloud computing typically go together. Yes, because you need the cloud to sort of be the back end for the edge device. Yeah, and once you have trained the model, once you have put that into a whole bunch of these edge devices, then they become very strong. Effectively, they are running their own version of the AI, whether it's a camera, whether it is a factory, whether it is a car. Yes, and this is able to then become intelligent. So this is a very big powerful idea of AI on edge devices. And of course at Oxford we go this very detail and this is exactly why I mentioned the companies I told you, uh, like for example, Intel, ARM, Nvidia, all of these companies are pushing on edge devices and also the cloud providers. So you have the Googles, the AWS, the Google Cloud, uh, the Azure, all these platforms work on the cloud. So this is why this idea goes together and it's a fairly sophisticated idea, meaning that you can't, uh, it is not just AI, it combines AI and the edge and things like this. So how does this look like again when it comes to something from NVIDIA? So this diagram actually is exactly similar to this diagram here, but it is a little bit more sophisticated. So here I just showed you in terms of pictures. Here it is showing you in terms of how it would look like when you do this. So what happens is you have an untrained neural network in this neural network, you have the training data set. You train it using a deep learning framework. You then get a trained model. This is the trained model. Then you push the trained model onto the inference stage where you are able to then run the trained model onto any device and the device is capable of identifying whatever you do. Yes, so for example, in this case, the device is capable of identifying a cat. If you see here, this picture looks like a picture of a cat. Yes, and if you see here, then you see it looks like a picture of a dog and a cat. Yes, so in this case, what you're doing is training the model with pictures of dogs, cats and other things. And in this case, what you're doing is taking the picture of a cat and the model is training that this is a cat, as you can see here. So here it has put a label to it as a cat, but the typically interesting area here is that this side of it, this part of it, the right hand part of it is actually could be running on any device. Yes, so this right hand part of it is running on an edge device and that means it is running into something like 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 a camera. It could be a, a Raspberry Pi. It could be an NVIDIA Jetson device and so on and so forth. Yes, so this is why the idea of AI and edge go together and the way they go together is that you train the model in the cloud and you push it on the edge device and this is what I mean by saying that this is a quite a sophisticated topic uh, and it is also a topic which is growing very fast as you can imagine uh, we are still not seeing the full impact of this so for example I think when I was introduced we talked about 5G Today we can announce that we announced about a month ago we are working with Verizon, who is the second largest or the largest US operator, and we are working with them to understand how to uh, how to put AI on 5G on private 5G networks and things like this. So this is another huge area where we are collaborating very hard. Why does this work in 5G? Because with 5G you need 5G for all those AI applications. Now why do you need 5G for AI applications? Uh, typically on the edge devices because 
because without 5G, you don't have a broad area network. You just have a narrow uh, a local area network, which means that you can rely, rely on Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or something like this, but the network connectivity will not stretch outside of that. But with 5G, of course, it's like your phone. It can be anywhere. And then when you look at enterprises, it becomes even more interesting because then you have something called a private 5G network, which means that you can almost run your own network your own 5G network inside your own factory. Yes, with your own SIM cards. That is a very powerful idea because it means that you can effectively run your own 5G like system. You can look at your latency, you can manage that and so on and so forth. This is where I think the world is going and this is why this subject is so important because 5G, we are just at the point of coming to 5G. Here in the UK, there's a lot of talk about 5G, partly because it is look, it is looked at one of the key infrastructures post COVID. Yes, because after COVID, we have to look at what is going to happen to the economy. 5G is one of the big drivers to the economy, and that is like putting a road in the road across the UK or something like this. And this infrastructure has to be there so that we can create the next next generation applications and the next generation services. And this is how this world comes together. And it's a good time to look at this world, partly because it's like the perfect storm, meaning that you are combining all these different things which are coming together at the right time. So we have 5G just about coming out. We have the cloud, which is very common. You have the edge which is now, which was the Internet of Things device. The edge devices are capable of running more uh, hardware and more uh, type of devices within there and so on and so forth. So what happens is that you are building your model on the cloud. Like I said, these are the typical five or six steps for that. You get the training data, you use transfer learning. This is something which is a new technique which is being used quite a bit with AI models and then you push it on edge devices and you and you do classification for that. Now why does this matter is because IoT is basically causing a digital disruption of the physical world. Yes. So everything when it becomes a smart object, yes, you're disrupting it physically. So the physical object no longer has a has a has only the physical object. So if you look at the concept of a digital twin, I think we talked about this in one of the previous Gurj Marathi sessions. I'm not sure whether Mr. Bhandari talked about it or somebody else talked about it, but the idea of a digital twin is very powerful because what that means is everything which has a physical concept, physical object, has a software and an AI equivalent somewhere in the cloud. And this is where the world is going, yes? So this is what exactly is happening, that all these things are being mirrored in the, in the cloud and all of them have a one-to-one -one correspondence and then you can model these ideas, you can extrapolate them, you can capture data and so on and so forth. So what is happening is whole industries will be disrupted by this. So this is the sort of the way we look at look at the world from that perspective. So you have the lowest layer, which is the Internet of Things. Then you have the AI layer. Then you have the business transformation layer. Yes, so the moment you have uh, these two pieces coming together, which is already happening, you are seeing whole industries being transformed. You're seeing education, energy, transportation, healthcare, all of these things. This is already happening. And I think with COVID, it is going to happen even more. Yes. Is that this stage of AI enabled industries is going to become a lot faster. Now, self driving car is a classic example of that, but everything from agriculture. So, in the first, uh, in the Gajimarati session mentoring, we had uh, we had Sanket uh, Kedar, and he had an agriculture application, and this was actually using some AI in agriculture. So, every field you are looking at will have this capability of being sensor enabled, AI enabled and then the business process will change. Yes, so all of this is sort of not happening in isolation, but it's happening together across all of these things. Now, if I were to give you one example, I would say that this, this is like a drone, which be becomes a supervisor at a construction site. Yes, if you have a construction site, you, you may have a drone or a group of drones which can be a supervisor on the site. They can see everything. They have cameras. They can see what is happening. They can see the security issues. They can see how progress is happening and they can report down down to the person who's actually running on the construction site. Why is this a good example? Because it does. It's a completely B2B example. Yes, it doesn't require any consumer participation as the owner of this construction site. I have total control over this. Yes, and the moment I put a 5G network around this space, I am I'm fine. 
Yes, I run my own drones, I run my own AI. Everything is working in that context. Yes, so this is really where the world is going, and this is why all these things coming together are such a powerful idea. And some numbers before I conclude. So what I'm trying to say here to you is that if you look at some of these numbers, McKinsey, we talks about big things. GE talks about the, uh, the economy, which is 10 to 15 trillion by 2030, which is the current China's GDP. But the last number is very important. The last number comes from a from an from a, uh, agency called Wikibon, who say that 99% of Internet of Things data will live and die on the edge. Yes, meaning that you will never send the data in its original form back to the cloud. What you will do is you will take the data, you will do something with it, you will process it, you will send only an aggregated version back to the cloud. This will save you bandwidth, this will save you cost, and this is what will drive AI in the on the edge devices within there. So to conclude, finally, I think that this is really what is all happening with that. Uh, feel free to also connect with me on LinkedIn. I will also share with you once again that we are going to start another Garje Marathi mentoring program like we did last time. Uh, and, and please connect to Anand for this. And again, I will be running it with a group of five or six entrepreneurs and we can sort of work with that. Uh, and most of what I'm talking about is just this, meaning that it is AI, but it is also this, meaning that it is an edge device. And also the mechanism is something like this, where it is sort of connecting to the central device, and then it is driving everything. Yes, from everything from self-driving cars to uh, manufacturing to security cameras. So thank you very much. So this concludes my talk, which means we have very good time for questions. Yes. Good. Okay. Excellent. I have. Uh...